So why don't we just start at the beginning? Oh, so we put these slides for it, uh, up here. They're a little bit of a timeline. We had a really great time kind of reminiscing. And oh, you can see it up here, guys. Oh, okay. here. Um, identifying like, some of the key milestones about Games for Change. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through. And these are just kind of, kind of cycled through um, uh, as we talk. But let's go back to the beginning, because I want to hear about how you guys, and share how you guys knew each other. Um, did you know each other? Yeah. How'd you come to this realization that there's something there to create? You want to start, Suzanne? Uh, sure. Well, for me, it was a long journey. I played a game called Hidden Agenda, and I'm going to date myself, uh, 1989. And it was a game about Central America, and it was very powerful. And I'd been working documentary film, and I thought, wow, this is an incredibly engaging experience. I have agency. And so I sort of kept a list of games, social issue games, mm -hmm. and there weren't very many. I kept going back to the Game Developers Conference, and I couldn't find any. I was looking for meaningful games, so you know, I didn't make many friends, I have to say. Um, and Barry and I were working together at yep. Web Lab, in the late 90s. Think Tank, in the late... Yeah, an innovative web funding nonprofit, a genre that's not very large, <laughs> um, founded by and run by Mark Weiss, who had innovated uh, POV, the Independent Documentary Film Series, currently celebrating its 30th year. Uh, and we worked there for many years. And I left Web Lab to go work at Global Kids, a uh, uh, New York City-based after-school organization that works with urban youth around the city and now in other cities as well. And we started exploring different forms of digital media to work with youth, not only to be creators, but also producers, not, not just consumers, but producers. And we started thinking about what that would mean like in games. And Suzanne and I reconnected because she had this idea. And we started talking. And she told me about, I think you told me about the Serious Games, serious games yeah. in DC. You want to talk about that and we'll yeah. bring Ben in? And we looped Ben in. And Ben was doing some interesting work then. Uh, OK. Um, so I was working in an organization called NetAid. And NetAid came out of the United Nations Development Program and Cisco Systems. Uh, it was based here in New York, so it was a funny hybrid of UN people um, and digital people who thought the internet could fight poverty. That was, at the time, it was in around 1999-2000. Uh, um, and we had a board game that was doing very well in classrooms, and we wanted to make a digital version. So I was kind of managing this effort to develop this digital version. We were working with people like uh, Eric Zimmerman's team at Game Lab. Uh, to try and kind of build out this prototype, um, but not finding a lot of other nonprofits that were doing similar things. So we heard about this event that was happening in Washington, D.C., um, where some other people might come together and find people of, of a similar mind. The serious Games, right? Dave Rajeski. Yep. So this yeah. was Dave Rajeski's yeah. effort with Ben Sawyer um, that was already going on the Serious Games Initiative. Which was very much focused on what you'd expect for D.C. It was uh, government agencies. But we had someone here with a social change agenda, uh, nonprofit, mission-driven, youth focus. And David was very supportive. We said we want to be a, a special interest group. And there were a number of folks who wanted to do a number of different subgroups. And he said, great, if you guys want to organize in New York, I'll help you get off the ground. I'll help you find a space for the first event, the Games for the Greater Good Conference. He got us the connection <laughs> with the New York Academy of Science. And we were so excited to get to 40 attendees. And that might have been counting the three of us as well. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting that you talked about serious games and then games for change. So how, because this question I get asked often, like how do we distinguish ourselves or how did you at the time distinguish themselves from serious games and why is games for change an important you know, way to frame what, what you wanted to do? Well, the name Games for Change came a little bit later, and initially we had two different aspects that we were interested in, um, which we weren't sure if they were the same group or the same, and one was just a different set of people. So nonprofits, for example, that wanted to make games of any kind, and some were educational, yep. um, some might be trying to change behavior, some might be health. So Raising they, but, global awareness But there, the issues. idea these were yep. organizations that were not trying to make a bunch of money and they weren't a huge hospital. So it was about a, a, yep. a sector, like the nonprofit sector's <laughs> approach to games. That was, that was one version of it. And the other side was, no, no, it's, it's a little bit more about the content. So this was a little bit more of the documentary film model. Um, we want to tell diff different stories, different kinds of content in there. And I think each of us had different connections to one aspect of those. And we kept seeing how they would come together. Um, and that came a little into the organization. Games for Change was one way to do kind of an umbrella. Is that something yeah, and, yeah. And, and yeah. to put this in the context, this was at the time where if you read about games in the news, you were usually reading about you know, anti-game pieces right. looking at a Grand Theft Auto, let's say, um, and seeing, saying how, on one hand, wow, look what's happening in games. There's a lot of 
uh, um, energy and attention going on, but what they're doing is so bad. So there was um, a context that said, oh, wait a second, we're talking about the good side of games. Maybe this is the place to hear about the good games, which is not something that we were about. We weren't saying there's good games and bad games, and we're going to be about the good games, but we fell into that cultural debate uh, and cultural context. So it was very important for us to, on one hand, explain what we thought were the, a number of different ways that games had positive impact on, on users and on, on the players and on society, but at the same time not let people use that to see, aha, and so here's the good games, and we'll then use that to talk about, don't, don't play the bad games, here's the good stuff. And I think also we, there was a moment where we were gonna call it um, non-profit games. <laughs> this was quickly, not very catchy. quickly <laughs> um, rejected because we also knew and said, you know, we always thought big and we said, there are going to be industry games for change someday. We always felt that, we always wanted that, and so, when we came up with the name Games for Change, it just seemed perfect because it really embraced industry, nonprofits, education, philanthropy, and everyone could, That's could, what made could the make festival a game for success. change. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. 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 No, and the festival, you know, thinking of it as a festival as well, rather than just a conference, sort of broke it out of yeah. education or nonprofits and really made it about culture and creating a new kind of culture, basically. One of the things that I've um, uh, identified about the early days of, of Games for Change, and for a while is the, I, mean, I still say the heart of Games for Change is its commitment to social and civic issues, right? And that's, it was around that space that you guys were um, uh, collecting people and, and building this, this community. Whereas it has evolved beyond then, the last few years particularly, to kind of really embrace games and learning and the games and health space. Um, but what was it about the civic piece that you felt like that's where you wanted to, to you know, you know, own or, or help develop? I mean, uh, I think it was when we had our first definition of game, games for change, it was games um, that engage people in the serious issues of the day. Um, so, is it this? It, uh, it was really, you know, it was broad in that sense, mm -hmm. is that we were never going to limit um, the issues. It was always the, the serious and pressing issues of the day. So yeah. that sort of made it very broad. And I think, you know, there are some education games that were very much about that. And there were other kinds of games that health games and Asi and I have had long conversations about public health and how that is a social issue, and I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, just maybe one piece to add in terms of historical perspective as we're thinking back, because 15 years ago, sometimes history can feel for, like more recent than it is, by, by which I mean, in this case, um, it may seem like educational games are new, and in some ways they are, but actually they that was what felt established when we were talking in 2004, 2005. We're like, oh, I played Carmen San Diego. I did a bunch of, there's an educational game. Oregon games, Trail. Oregon Trail. Yeah. Like, there, that has, has been there and was actually a part of the culture, maybe not a legitimized part of the culture, but the civic side, we could point to very few examples of any coherent conversation. So in some ways it was trying to do something new and have a new conversation around the, the civic that I thought brought yeah. us together. Yeah. So, and, oh, can I also add too? And so you hear none of us are coming at that time from a game design background. So it was crucial for us to work with folks in the game design community. Ben mentioned a game lab who I also worked with as well and Eric Zimmerman was key from the first session, helping us understand things like you hear us talking about the, the good thing we're talking about is the content of the game but then we learn actually the experience you have playing the game or the way it connects you with other people or connects you with society isn't always embedded in the skin itself or the the system that you're exploring those are all valid and important things to explore but that there's so many ways to have social impact and personal impact with games but we started with a focus on the thing that we knew which was the social issues the global issues the civic issues and then as we built that up we saw as people came into the festival festivals and in the early days, we had meetups that were going on every month where we had salons where people would come together and talk and then connect with each other. In different that cities there were different, and different cities and different countries. That there are lots of different ways that games can be having impact in people's lives. And then the festival, and I think the strength of the festival for the last 15 years, has been adapting and making a space for all these communities yeah. and adapting to them. So I'd like to just comment on this great pic photo, by the way. You're looking very good. Is that Eric? That's yeah. not Eric. That is Eric's That's Eric. That's, That's my Eric. house. What's that? That's your house. That's my loft. Yeah. That's your house? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm taking the picture. Um, and here's another picture of one of your first. Connie. 
sessions? Yeah, Connie. Yeah, so that's Connie oh Yao, second from the right, <laughs> um, who led the Digital Media and Learning Initiative um, at that's the MacArthur Foundation for many years and was a, a, a ma major influence not only in the digital learning space around the country, but in, in Games for Change itself, and some of us ended up working there as well. Um, but one of the reasons why I was motivated to do Games for Change was I wanted to meet Connie. And I knew if I could organize something and she would sit on the panel, I would get to meet her. <laughs> And, and that worked. That's great. Yeah, so funding was actually, at the, from the beginning, part of where Games for Change came from. Uh, I was actually fundraising at the time, uh, and we had a game where we were like, we have to hit, uh, um, you know, half a million dollars or it's not going to be worth making this thing. And we had raised like the 250,000. We were kind of like working our way. We have to meet more funders. And so this was, we were very deliberate in inviting funders to this very first Cerna gathering. Cerna was there. Cerna, Ford, yeah. MacArthur. That's right. Um, and so it was, in some ways, that... In the, in the nonprofit sector, that kind of like conversation mm -hmm. with funders is always a part of how you actually build the field. Um, and so I actually remember on that very first yeah. panel, Connie uh, said, uh, MacArthur might fund games, but it's going to take five plus years. It's going to be a while because boards of foundations are always more conservative than their program officers. Uh, we have to convince our board to do something as crazy as right. games, and that's going to take a while. MacArthur actually did it in much less time than they mm -hmm. thought, and I think it was actually partly because Games for Change gave them credibility. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of a mutual handshake that was going on between the funders that were trying yeah. to fund games but couldn't because their boards wouldn't support them, right. um, and the organizations that needed the funding. Right. Well, I remember, and this goes, I mean, from my time too, of uh, applying on some grants and being advised not to call it games, but to use uh, interactive experiences uh. or interactive learning. I don't know if that still exists as kind of like a you know, a uh, hidden signal of what we're doing. But before we talk about funders, because I do want to talk about that, I'd like to uh, talk to Asi. This, to, this is before you came on board, Sue. So you came on board in 2010. Ten. But before that, you made Peacemaker. Yeah, and actually, I, I think I met you guys. When probably you were a student. GDC. Yeah. It was Ben and Already ben and in the I. first year that yeah. you just started, yeah. Yeah. showing you a demo, running after you, and yeah. telling you this could be a Games for Change. And well, the fact that yeah. you three are saying you're, you are not game designers or developers. We right? weren't then. You weren't then. You are now. Okay, but at the time, right? You weren't yeah. coming right. it from that perspective. That's right. But here, Asi, you were. You were studying it. And right. so you also yeah. saw the potential at that time, right? That this is something, and I mean, you obviously wanted to get involved. Peacemaker it. was like the poster child for Games for Change. And I remember, we got a ton of press in, in the early days, and I always directed them to Aussie because it was really rare that there was a game that was a social change game that was actually good. There was like three of them at the time you could right, count to. And I mean, Aussie was like getting calls constantly because there weren't just that many people you could send a reporter to. It was also, I think, that there was this recycle recyclable media, you know, like every reporter that wanted to write about it looked at what the other reporter wrote right. about it. So right. the same three, four games. Right. Can you explain the game for those who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, so Peacemaker, uh, to those of you who don't know, it was a simulation it? or is still a simulation okay. uh, because you can still play it on iOS uh, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and you can play both perspectives. And we did it uh, at Carnegie Mellon and, and I think one of the reasons that Suzanne, you mentioned that it was more meaningful than others that we did it over three years. It was a very big investment. A lot of it thanks to the university standing behind it. And mm -hmm. later we started a company out of it, which was probably also one of the first developers that tried to sustain themselves in, in the space. Mm -hmm. But I, I was at every event, you know, as a developer, yeah. following your growth and everything. And that's what we needed. We needed examples that we can put out on platforms like this to say, this is examples of what we're looking for in our community. This is what our community is about. We want you to not make this game, but games like this that had that strong balance of um, social impact uh, and game design that understood Good the connection gameplay. between that two and had a mechanism for putting it out into the world as well, which you did very successfully. And you were great in, in give, giving the developers the exposure. I mean, that was from the first day, and we tried to keep it after that. The idea that this is, at the end of the day, the platform for the games or the developers. Uh, it's putting them in, in the front and not, uh, you know, not the organization per se. So what point do you feel that, I think, mean, was there a milestone in Games to Change? We said, you know, we really have something here and it's, you know, press is paying attention. I'm looking at the slide and I see, you know, Games to Change story in the Washington Post. I see some major partnerships like with Microsoft, right? I see um, Sandra Day O'Connor keynoting, right? So is, is that right, the right time? 2008 was a big year? I would say 2007. 
I think um, Microsoft coming and coming mm -hmm. um, and being our first sponsor was a really big deal. And Xbox. Can you say more about the contest that you did? With so uh, Microsoft came to us and they had just launched XNA, which is the game developer platform on the Xbox platform. And um, they were really interested in environmental games at the time. And so we partnered with them. They sponsored our festival. We partnered with them. We went to Paris for the Imagine Cup, which is a big deal every year. Thousands and thousands of college kids um, make games, and then there are contests for different categories. And Games for Change, environmental games was one category. Um, and it was just, it was just mind blowing, you know, the fact that we were just little games for change. I think we, I don't even know how many employees we had, but that happened to us a lot. That we had these huge stories and we had these huge partnerships and, and there was like three people in the office, you know, we just try to like answer the phone in another voice, you know, or something. It was like, so I think you're right, really Suzanne. Crazy. I think first industry recognized, big industry recognized the importance of games yeah. and games for change being a vehicle for them to connect with the space. Right. And then we started seeing individuals from outside the space. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in 2008, right. Nicholas Kristoff in 2009, uh, Al Gore a few years later. It was so important back then, 10 years ago at this point, to have recognition from other fields that this was important. Um, we were still, there was a certain amount of insecurity, I think, in this space. And so having people from outside saying there's something valuable here and it being outside this debate of the good game, bad game. Sometimes those um, schisms still showed up in what they were speaking about, but in the actions, especially the development of civics from Justice Senator O'Connor, show that these are now exemplars being made by people who've come through our space, right. shaped by it, and then putting out the exemplars that we can then bring back onto the stage. Um, that to me was a major shift of saying, wow, things are changing, not in games are changed per se, although it was, but in the broader society and how we're understanding games and what it can mean for people. All right. So at what point did your conversation turn from, oh, I, love the lo I like the logo up on the left, yeah. It's what the point website, right? Did yep, the conversation right. turn from, or has it even happened yet, of advocating that games can be positive, like what is it, right? Mm -hmm. To, like, or is it? like having to prove that it could be, or having, as opposed to this idea that it could, and then to like how to implement it and getting more people on board to, to fund it. So like, I, I feel as if we've gotten over that hump, um, although we're constantly advocating. It's back and forth. Yeah. Yes, you're right, right. I think, please. No, go ahead. I think when Jane McGonigal's uh, TED Talk came out, hey, look, it's me, hi. Um, when Jane's <laughs> TED Talk got so successful and that led to her appearances on late night television. And then her book came out, which was just one big message, games are good. Um, yeah. That encompasses so much. And she's able to go in, in depth into her book, but all the different ways that one could make that case. That came up, became a whole new way of framing the conversation in the public sphere for the press to talk about it, for corporations to talk about it, for people in education to talk about it. And that I think gave us much more Breathing room. Although, Asya, this is that's your space. You were leading at that time when that happened, right? Is it, yeah. So, yeah. I'm talking about because that is around the time that you you came in, and you also found yourself, I think, like Suzanne was saying, in like being a small fish in a big pond, but people paying attention. Right. And then, then in, in 2011, here, here is the timeline. Um, we also brought Al Gore. Now, every every story like this is is always because it's a community organization. Is always the the good side and the, the challenging side. So for example, we brought Al Gore and, uh, and he spoke uh, at NYU and it was the keynote and, um, and you know, it was all arranged by email, you know, it wasn't even that. Uh, Which that, you can uh, see out in the pop-up museum. Outside. Right, right, we brought yeah. the original all email. Emails. Uh, I think you started the conversation with I did, him. It took us I, I two couldn't years. Believe those three years yeah. to get him to say yes. So you think, wow, what a big moment! You know, the vi someone who was vice president uh, standing on the on the stage and saying games are the new the new normal. But at the same time, he says, I didn't play games since Pong, and that really, I mean, it was a moment, but it was also something that really upset a lot of uh, game makers. Yeah. Uh, that here we bring someone from the outside that is not really authentic or, uh, you know, what, what does it really mean? And there, there was a disconnect between, you know, and, and that was kind of one of those moments between, you know, we bring all those big names, bring all those big organizations, all those funders, all those suits, but uh, where, where are the games and where are the game makers? And when, then we made a big 
pivot to focus really on the quality of the games and the developers? Like, how do we create more quality content? Um, that's what, is that around the time you started working with Nicholas Kristof? Yes, and that was, uh, that was one of the reasons that was something that Alan and Suzanne started because they brought him in 2009 mm -hmm. to Keynote, and he said, okay, I'll Keynote, but make a game for me. Can I just correct something? Eric Zimmerman, I don't know if he's out here, actually introduced us to him because nice. they found Eric, and Eric was like, this is really good for you guys. So yeah. thank and, you, Eric. Yeah. And Alan, we we'll mentioning is Alan Gershenfeld, who's the uh, president of Eline Media, but he had been our chairman for a long time. Yes. yes. And, the, and the project you're talking about with Nicholas Kristof is? Half the Sky. So, so very quickly on that, the, his message was, I'm coming to you guys. I'm coming to you, Suzanne and Alan, and later Asi and Michelle, Michelle Bird. She's yes. not with us, but she's, She's now in Europe, but she's, uh, she was co-running uh, the organization with me. And he said, I want to do Off the Sky in a game because I'm always speaking to the same people. When I'm writing in the New York Times, with the documentary that we're going to do on PBS, with uh, the book that we, is a bestseller, we're still speaking to the converted. I want a game that will go much beyond that. And it was very odd for Games for Change to make a game. But part of the reason we went for that was that kind of quality switch. We said, if we do it, maybe we can get more funding than a small developer would get. Maybe we will have broader partnerships, which happened, and the support of the gaming industry, which happened with Zynga, that basically marketed it for us. So that was part of that, but it was a very interesting thing that suddenly we produced something. Here you go, there's Michelle. And there you are working on Half the Sky. Yeah. Um, so where did half the, oh, let me go back for a second. So where did half the sky go? So why don't you describe the project? So um, what, what Chris, uh, Nick and Cheryl really were interested in is this Facebook game. Uh, back then, Facebook was the platform that was, uh, you know, all the big games, Farmville. I mean, it's, it's funny that only a few years ago and now it's already gone. But uh, it was the most uh, talked about platform. And we made a, basically a Farmville version uh, where instead of building your community and building your farm, you're actually building impact and you can donate money. And uh, this equation of, you know, I'm, I'm uh, raising a goat in the game, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm building my farm, or I'm uh, helping women, and then immediately you can uh, donate money to an NGO. Um, and then we made uh, also three mobile games for in, uh, women in India and Kenya. And that led to a USAID. Yes, for, for their support, yes. Yeah. Um, so, that, um, so that is part of, I guess, this next phase of when uh, Asi, you and Michelle was running the, the organization and um, uh, focused a lot on um, outward consulting and bringing, also bringing more people into this space. So uh, this is uh, the beginning of when I started working with you guys in, in partnerships. But also, there was a healthy relationship now of bringing the Games for Change methodology that was developed with Eli Media into other not for profits. So, this does continue the original ethos of, um, of, of not for profits and Games for Change coming together. You want to talk a little bit about those efforts? Yeah, I also want to talk about something we did with Ben. Maybe we can bring it up. I think it was in the 10th anniversary that you came to me or something like that. And you said uh, something like, Okay, we speak about games and impact, and, and we speak about games can change. What exactly they can change? Can we start to put categories in place? And that led to the, you want to speak about the typology project oh, a bit? Oh, sure, yes. Um, the Packard Foundation gave some funding to Games for Change, uh, and uh, with some of that money, we, we wrote a report that was trying to talk about how people, even within Games for Change, use the same words to mean very different kinds of things. Um, and I, I feel like that's actually kind of at the heart of Games for Change. It's always been about bridging across different areas. And, that's, and the controversy that comes with that is part of its power. I think that's kind of the double edge of the sword. Even from the beginning, I remember Ben Sawyer and others being like, what is this Games for Change thing? We don't need that. Serious Games Initiative is enough. Um, I, I remember people saying, no, we have GDC. I remember people saying, oh, I'm an academic. I've been doing this for like 10 years. And all of those things in some ways are true. 
and, it, and yet there, there are some differences um, that might be uh, useful to tease out. So this report is trying to tease out, well, maybe, what if we try to legitimize the different ways that people talk about impact? Uh, health has a community that talks about impact in certain ways. Education has a community that talks about impact in some ways. Games for Change often brings these together, um, but they also ha have deeper disciplines you could go into to go to other conferences. Uh, other conferences, other journals, other professionals. Other communities. Little, we put out a report. It's actually still up, gameimpact.net. You can download it if you want to see some yeah. of it. It's but a lot the of the, Oh, yeah, there's a cop copy. A but a lot of the critique, that is, it's based on initially a critique where we said we're talking past each other as much as there's, we, we sometimes say there is no impact, and what we mean is there's none of the impact that I like to see. Actually, there, there might be impact. In fact, I, um, I see impact in almost every game for change I look at. Uh, it's often hard to measure, but guess what? It's really hard to measure the impact of a textbook. It's really hard to measure the impact of a ch change a campaign on poverty. Uh, and, it, and I think that games are, are really hard to, to talk about, and we still talk past each other a little bit. Right. So anyways, that, that's a, w one example of a project that tried to look across almost yeah. from a linguistic perspective. And, and the other thing I think that that report that uh, Ben was leading uh, kind of revealed is that, to me at least, that you know, the beginning of the conversation when you talked about documentaries, I think we were still using uh, equations to traditional media. We we're like, okay, how can we tell people what Games for Change is when we compare it to film? And I think that what that project did, and obviously with the development of platforms and technology, suddenly we see that games can actually go to places where film cannot go, yeah. or where uh, theater or books cannot go. So suddenly you see something like neurogaming, uh, things that deal with behavior change, because of interactivity, because of uh, location-based. So that was also interesting to see how, you know, learning was easy for people to understand, documentary gaming was easy, but now we're going to places that the traditional media was not even. So, yeah, I might even put a crazy statement out there. I hope that Games for Change is always hard to explain. <laughs> and that's partly because that's, we're, we're still trying to figure out what it is, and that's what makes the space interesting. Um, well, I've had some of my best conversations here with people who have maybe been in the field for a long time. Uh, Tracy's here. I've had some great conversations with Tracy about like, what are games, where are they coming from? Um, and it's partly because this is a conference that is, set, is a little bit distant from GDC. It's distant from some of the education and technology conferences. It's distant from a lot of things, and yet it has its own space. So that hard to define this is part of what makes it interesting. It's also, and, and you guys know in the audience, super diverse audience. It was also always very challenging for us, even when we did, needed to sell tickets, because you have government agencies coming, you have museums and you know uh, cultural institutions, you have game developers, you have uh, people coming from uh, non-profits, obviously, um, you have uh, corporations. So really, really, I mean, that's what makes it really cool, because people meet each other across disciplines, but it was always very hard to say, what is this community, because it's so also, diverse. Also, making games yes. is incredible collaboration yes. across disciplines. These, Especially uh, impact games. More than, yeah. than any other uh, cultural form I can think of, where you're having somebody from a foundation or somebody from a nonprofit and somebody from game design and somebody you know, from history, his, historical background. I mean, those are great. And, and that's hard. But it's because I think you've been able, to, as, as leadership has passed on, you put the work in maintaining it as a space for multiple communities to see something for meaning for here that's made the festival be so successful for 15 years. The communities that come now are different than the community seven years ago and different from 15 years ago. But the ability to keep having that dynamic tension that comes from different communities coming together makes it a, a festival that you don't want to miss. It's a yeah. place you want to go to, where you know you're going to meet people from other spaces and things are going to happen. Now, I was curious, what, what do you think is the difference between, you know, if you can remember, uh, in an intangible way between now and, and yeah, I was going to say, what are the what are the assumptions that you made 15 minutes, years ago, right? That maybe about the but the future of the community that came true, or that you were wrong. Well, one thing that we have been talking about, just in terms of the structure of before and then, and the three of us versus you all, is that we were really grassrootsy. We came from nonprofit world, and we didn't have game technology experience very much. And so we were um, having lots of conversations and breakout groups and these um, groups that would meet in different cities in the United States or different countries. And um, we did things where everyone would pitch in all together. And, you know, 
this is a very different experience now. I mean, it's, it's a perfect trajectory of how a, uh, a conference or any kind of cultural event could grow from really sort of community-based into a much more polished and professional and bringing in more industry and other larger institutions sort of as you grow. You know, you took it to a next level, I think. Um, so, but I always think, and we talked about this before too, is that we always had gigantic visions for Games for Change. I think when we decided, and we had the conversation a lot, like let's not go and be a serious games, let's not bring in Games for Health or you know, different kinds of things, is because we thought Games for Social Change is gonna be huge. And we are gonna always have our hands full with this particular thing. Um, and yet, you know, I think by broadening it the way you all have done has been just genius because those, there's very hard to define what a Games for Change is, so it's much more open and welcoming to people of any stripe. Um, I think, you know, if somebody starts making a game about almost anything that's not sort of mainstream, they, they can come here and be welcomed. There's and a place they can, for them. Yeah. You know, find the tools find the they need. Yeah. Yeah, there, I think there was at one time, we've had a number of different visions. I'll put it as one just because it's, it's different. But there was a model that was going to be discussion groups in every city. Uh, and maybe in a big city, you'd have a bunch. You'd have like, like groups that are in Brooklyn, and, be, and there'd be groups that are in um, Hoboken. And they're just the groups would get together and they'd talk about games of the day um, and, and how they would modify them or change them on their own and, and how they could tie into society. So there's almost just like a, a, a conversational approach to it. And it would spread like wildfire. And at this point, industry would change and there would be demand <laughs> for different games. So that was like one very different vision that I think <laughs> something that's been an interesting surprise that we talk about the film analogy a, a bit um, is uh, how in some ways it's taken longer than we expected for the games industry to think about, oh, should we be engaged in civic stuff? I think that, that um, you know, in Los Angeles, for example, um, the people in film do all sorts of civic things around Los Angeles, but the games industry l largely doesn't have the same type of representation um, at like local civic things, doesn't have the same type of like giving. There are instances and certain great companies have done great things the entire time mm -hmm. the industry has been around. So it's definitely not across yeah, the industry. Just one exception, because it's, I think it's with us in the audience, Eric Huey and the ESA, yes. which is the lobby of Yay. the gaming. They've had the vision at the big level, but I think bringing the, this is one of these things we can say, because I, I can say- No, but you write about the companies themselves. I think trying to help more of those companies say, um, we're trying to do broader things yeah. has, has taken a little bit longer. In the same way, I think it's taken like a shockingly long time to realize we could even broaden our market base by like being in living rooms and having women play. We're still having that debate in the industry. It's like, oh, we want more women gaming at the heart of games. Yeah. So. But I would say that I, think, I imagine it has taken longer than, um, and even my five years of working with Aussie, it has took a long time. But I have to say, in the last couple of years, I've seen a really big change. And you can see that about who's speaking here and who bringing projects here. We to have Ubisoft here to, with a discovery uh, tour mode of um, Assassin's Creed. I mean, that was a conversation that started four years ago at our first Games for Learning Summit. Right? Um, Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go is here, right? You're working you know, with the Knight Foundation and, and researching Pokemon Go in cities. Riot Games is here. Um, so there are, um, Take Two was, you know, has been here. We do, are seeing uh, the mainstream industry take notice. Yes. It may not completely be infused in their culture yet, but they are, they certainly are aware and they see a place for them in this environment and want I, to be part of it. I think it was overly optimistic to hope that it might change okay. at, like overnight. <laughs> it does change with the people working there. And so I think that's, that's part of it is that changing that pipeline and getting more people in those companies has been uh, a great thing. It's also broadened. The early games for change, there wasn't the same vision of we have to like democratize the pipeline of the print, mm. which I think happened, happened later. So. Yeah. And I've always taken inspiration from the bigger visions you guys had, but my inspiration in many ways, that vision that I had was of a more practical nature. And it was given the context at the time where there were many organizations, nonprofits that saw that there was something engaging about games and thought they could use them somehow and thought they could just make them that they didn't understand the complexities of game design and what that meant and all the different pieces. And so what people needed was a place to go and meet 
game designers, independent game designers in New York and others from around the country, meet with others who have taken this on and figured out how you, how you convince your board or convince others that you work with that there's value to doing this, understanding how you do the distribution, understanding where to get the funding from. So for me, the festival was always about that one-stop shop. For me to come in uh, as uh, someone new to the space and learn everything I need to know so I can leave and have the partnerships in place, the, the language to talk about it, and be able to go and start implementing it. What you said was interesting. I remember going through an analysis of the attendees to both of your points about how it was such a, a broad mix of different uh, industries coming through, different sectors, but the amount of first timers who come through mm -hmm. and how the Games for Change Festival is often a not for profit or an organization's first introduction yeah. to this sector. And they know or they've heard that if they come here, they're, one, they're going to get their minds blown and open up going, oh my God, so much is possible. It's amazing stuff going on, but they're going to meet people who are actually going to be able to go and help make their stuff happen. The, the status with that is an interesting thing to watch that change. There's still a sense like if you're in a traditional AAA game company and you get a really great speaking gig at GDC and everyone loves your talk, that's great. That can really help your career. Like if you're, you come and speak at Games for Change, how does that work? Like there are certain places and certain companies, and Niantic I think is a good example of this. They, they're pretty civic in their mission. I think they really are well aligned mm -hmm. to come and speak at Games for Change. Um, I will contrast that though with something like academia. Something that, that I didn't realize for a while was there are people, academics, who have said, I got like my, my job advancement because Games for Change gave me this award. Like these, these somewhat kind of small things that Games for Change is like, well, we thought we'd do an award this year and we gave out, you, you won it. And the person's like, that changed my career. Like this, so I think Games for Change has had an influence in academia in some ways that, uh, just to contrast that with, we're still figuring out how that works with industry. Well, let's talk about the awards for a second because we haven't chatted about that. So those started a little later, right? 2007. Seven. Seven. Seven? Six, six or seven. Six or seven, yeah. And have the words always stayed, I should know this, but have they always stayed the same categories? Because I haven't touched them since mm -hmm. we started. So we've got best so. um, gameplay, most, most innovative. Gameplay. Yeah. I think you, you had challenge. I, when we came in, I think there was still a challenge on finding even enough games of quality. Yes, right? that's true. It was, it, which now we don't. We don't have that problem at all. I mean, we've got <laughs> We're hundreds, hundreds of, yes, hundreds of games yeah. are being That's submitted. Amazing. But yeah. back then it was really that you didn't even have enough yeah. no, we submissions didn't. and, op and, uh, and things that you wanted to show. Right. I think we had best impact gameplay an audience award, something like that. And I don't mean to keep pushing it, but you can see one afterwards in the pop-up. Uh, Global <laughs> Kids won the, one of the first ones um, for IED, The Cost of Life, and we were thrilled. I, I said one of the reasons why we were, the organization where I worked didn't mind me spending time helping to build a new organization was because it gave it a platform for our young people to go and be around adults who are professional game designers and others who cared about the space and show their work. And to be recognized from that with an award was tremendous. Um, tremendous for the young people, but also talking about people in their jobs. It helped me show this was worth the time that we were spending. We were being recognized in that space. So now you also have the video game awards having a social impact game category. And BAFTA also has something beyond entertainment or yeah. something like that yeah. too. So um, not that they're stealing our thunder or anything. Our, our awards are the best uh, uh, and they mean the most. More focus. More focus, more focus yes. Um, but that this is a, you know, a medium that is and creating content that should be acknowledged which is an amazing thing. Yeah, I think that that's for a field building organization or if just if your goal is to build a field in general, focusing attention on awards, what you're doing is you're creating deliberate scarcity, right? Only somebody gets to win. Uh, and we, like, as people who are interested in games, situations of deliberate scarcity, we should be like, oh, right, that's something that games are about too. Um, we're going we're gonna to say oh, you can only get points in certain ways or we're going to only uh, have this many places in the top That's 10 a game, finishers. sounds like a game mechanic of itself. Yeah, so I, th I feel like there's lots of ways in which yeah. uh, building a field has, has some kind of like game-like elements too. We want to keep having the position of games as they're understood culturally, move a few notches yeah. up. And, and we also, I mean, in, in, that, in that context, and I think you did it much before us, Suzanne, or you guys, we always compare it to Sundance or Tribeca, and we learn from them. I mean, some of the things that we tried to do were models that were already done in the film industry for decades. Right. So if we t um, talk about you talk about building the sector, which has been a big part of Games for Change and our, our uh, the evolution of Games for Change, but there are some efforts that I uh, say that you've been involved in, and I certainly have been, which is more public facing. 
now, right? So whether it's work with students, yeah. I mean, uh, this, and also the kind of arcades that we've been bringing around. Yeah, so maybe maybe actually you should you should speak about the student challenge because this is was I remember your initiative and uh, even before you you became the the president. But the idea that also, I mean, this is a bit in, uh, internal, but we also suffered from this thing that we have this huge event every year, or for us it's huge to to get to prepare it. And what else are we doing? And, and the Student Challenge is the first program that became as big, as, as uh, influential as the festivals. Yeah, so um, I'd like to very much. Thank you for that <laughs> opportunity. Um, okay, so the Student Challenge, the Games to Change Student Challenge is a program that we started three years ago. And it came out of a, I guess, a, a, a challenge to us to come from a, a friend of ours named Michael Preston, who now runs CS for All. Um, but at the time was at the Department of Ed in New York. And he said, you know, I would love there to be a competition around video games for students in the same way there are competition for poetry or competition for creative writing or for art making or Tribeca does filmmaking. Like, this should be one for video games. You guys should do it. We're like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's see if we can do it. And what it evolved into being is not only a, a citywide competition, uh, for kids to make games around social impact issues, but we realized that we also had an opportunity to get into schools and actually bring game design curriculum into the classroom that wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity. Because there are kids out there who are coding and they're coding camps and all that, but that's not the majority of the kids. So we were able to put a, a program together and get the funding in place to offer 20 schools a year an opportunity to uh, train teachers to run a curriculum by our, our amazing curriculum partner, Mouse. Uh, org, who has a serious games course that we modified for our purpose. And now we are in our third year. I see Alex is up there. He's, he's been working with teachers for the last three years. Um, we've taught over 60 teachers in New York, but we're also in Los Angeles, Detroit, Atlanta, and Pittsburgh, um, thanks to partners that are inviting us to into their cities. They see this very successful program. We're reaching uh, underserved communities teaching kids, giving the kids the opportunity to learn how to be game designers, marrying that with an opportunity to think about civic issues. So it's the computer science and 21st century skill building stuff, which is you know very important. But also uh, saying, but you have this opportunity to make content that actually can impact your environment. And that combination, I think, is, uh, has been a very attractive one along with mentorship opportunities from universities like NYU and game designers in each, in each, um, in each particular city, and then local game jams they produce, and this big awards ceremony that we just had on Saturday um, at the Intrepid. So you have this moment to really celebrate our, our students who participate. And it's gotten very successful. Um, we were invited to Los Angeles by the Annenberg Foundation. So we are going to have a year two in Los Angeles. We had over 183 games submitted our first year in LA, which is tremendous, and right? You have, you have General Motors in Detroit. Yeah, so General Motors invited us to bring the program to Detroit and Atlanta. Yeah. And then we're also in New York and Pittsburgh and interested in, in going to different yeah. cities. So um, this, this is a program that has grown, and there's a demand for it. Yeah. There is funding for it, and we, I do believe that you know, we, we are inspiring the next generation of game designers or content creators to be thinking about civic responsibility. Yeah, and I might even say, uh, beyond game designers, it's, it's almost like there are very few things we could ask kids to do in school that have them balance these kind of skills, where they're not just thinking about systems and technical aspects, but they're also thinking about social issues yeah. and content. And that merger, I think, is really where some of that push from looking at STEM to STEAM, um, it can't even go back to something that Dave Rajeski was talking about at the very beginning, when he said, do games for change, um, but it, not, not in those terms, but basically said, you guys should do this. He, his, he said something kind of crazy, which I can I feel like I can repeat now that we're a little, we have enough historical distance. He's like, Games for Change is, is going to do the interesting stuff more interesting than what the other Games for Health and other places are doing. Hmm. And, the, and the reason he thought it was be interesting is because of the, I, exactly that combination. When you're not just taking an established uh, content set and saying, well, we're going to make it 
uh, fun, but instead you're teaching people how to bring these pieces together, the systems and the civic. Uh, that's a really hard, complex thing to do. So I think this is a, a great uh, transition for the organization to have been doing some of this capacity building uh, with young people as well, and to be able to point to the examples about how professionals are doing it at the yeah. same time. It also gives an opportunity for do some like public awareness building that there are, again, back to you from the very beginning, there are some amazing games out there you know, they're, they're, the, the games can be more than just pure entertainment. And getting kids thinking about that at a young age when they are playing Fortnite or whatever, you know, you know uh, Overwatch, which are awesome games and I, they're wonderful to play, but there's this whole other way that games can be applied and they can be part of that ecosystem in creating it. When I look back at the 15 years of Games for Change, that to me is one of the things that I am most excited about. When we started Games for Change 15 years ago, when Global Kids started teaching game design, um, the, the founder of, of uh, Global Kids spoke here on one of our stages, uh, Carol Ardijani, and she said when she went to principals saying, I want to bring game design into the classes, they were saying, one of the principals said, that's like bringing porn into the school. Why would we do that? <laughs> that was the attitude 15 years ago. And now Games for Change is not alone in giving young people access to the opportunities to learn how to design games or learn how to code. But we're the ones who are doing it, or you're the ones who are doing it and leading that work around the social engagement piece because it's that big of a space. Yeah. And so to be able to be part of that and to push it and to broaden it, that, yeah. that's that's tremendously transformative That's on the impact of the next generation. Years, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, we are being welcomed by school districts to come in. I mean, we've got we're developing a relationship, I don't know if Kalanda is out there, but uh, with, the re, with the relationship with the Detroit, Detroit public school systems who are you know, focusing on their CS strategy, which is you know, a, a critical uh, uh, area of focus for many, you know, for all schools, and that games design and the Games to Change Student Challenge is this kind of really fun applied learning opportunity. For kids like yeah they're learning these skills let's go make a game like that's awesome right it's kids are just really jumping at the chance to apply the, those skills in that way because they're passionate about it right it's going to where the kids passions are and very never civic all right um so i want to move on and talk about a couple more things because we we um only have a few, uh, 10 minutes left um i want to share a little bit about what we've been doing um, beyond games, because for those of you who are here for the third day, you will see that we have kind of expanded our community to welcome in um, other forms of, of interactive media. So, um, which is the XR for Change um, initiative, which we started last year. Um, and this is really born out of um, an observation that we were seeing within our community that there were many, many d developers in our space who were exploring how to make impact experiences, game experiences within, um, within uh, a VR, AR, and MR. But at the same time, there were a lot of um, non-for-profits and NGOs who were also looking for new ways to connect with, with, with their communities, right? Um, and we, as a convener of a multidisciplinary you know, uh, practitioners, we're in, a, in a, a great space to help support and grow the sector as well. And I think we've been met with a lot of positive interest. Um, the, the XR for Change Summit that we are gonna hold again for the second time is you know, pretty much sold out. And what we've noticed is that a lot of people who are buying tickets are buying it for three days. They're not just here for games and they're not just here for VR, MR, AR. They're here because they're interested in interactive media and everything that it can offer. Um, so it's er, you know it's early days, but I do feel as if there is this certainly crossover community, even with documentary, with journalists, you know, with journalism, where what we're really talking about is the power of engagement within this kind of interactive media. Um, so That's, it's great, and it's also an interesting challenge. I heard an earlier speaker today say, "Oh, do, I realize I may, maybe need to explain what games do or why games." Um, and it's like, there's a part of me that's like, geez, I can't believe we're still saying <laughs> why games after 15 years. Uh, and yet, actually, this, some of the VR, XR space, it's like, it, wait, is 360 video a game? Does that, that makes it a game, right? It's interactive, right? It's, it's fun. It's, we add fun. We add play. It's good. I, I, I do think that we're still, this is another thing that's taken longer than I, would ex I, I might have expected. There's still a huge value for Games for Change to, to help those folks understand what is the game part of it. Like, if, if you just do VR, 
VR, that's not the same as games. If you don't have any of the structures for engagement and trying to define, oh, if I'm going to go and get a degree in games, does it just mean that you know how to program? And if it's not just know how to program, can we define what that other thing is? So I think we still are trying to frame that and articulate that. Uh, to our, and I think Games for Change is positioned to help do some of this. But I think that that cross-interest shows where we can still keep doing more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the one thing I think that is different on, with XR, with VR, AR, is that they, they don't need to answer the question of why not entertainment. They have this, I mean, that medium has this advantage that it's clear to everyone from the beginning, that's why Facebook is, you know, uh, bought uh, Oculus, that it's much more than entertainment. It's going to be training and education and experiences. Social. And, yeah, and travel. And uh, we, we, had, we had a very different problem at the beginning with games that it was so uh, burned in people's perception that this is entertainment. Yeah. This is only fun. Yeah. It, and it, can't, it cannot it's fun, it can't be, be serious. Right. I mean, we're actually destroying the fun of, of games by doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is interesting that they're kind of just jumping into it with, uh, you know, very smoothly. Well, I would love to uh, talk for the last few minutes um, uh, is that my slide? That's not me. It's the screen. It's pretty. Screen. Okay, that's right. We'll stay there. Um, uh, just talk about some personal moments, like your proudest moments of Games for Change. When you reflect back, and you guys have, have moved on to work in different fields and related fields, when you say, like, I I'm so glad we did this. I'm so glad I was part of that. I feel so, you know, warm and fuzzy inside. Okay. Well, I, I have to say, having um, introduced one of my great heroes, Sandra Day O'Connor. The Honorable Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was um, really an amazing moment for me. And I remember coming back and sitting in the audience. I was I had tears in my eyes, and I sat down next to Barry, and he was he, he was just so sweet. I don't I can't remember exactly what you said, but something along the lines of, you know, this is a moment I never would have imagined from our early days at Web Lab, which were ten years earlier, and um, was just was just wonderful. Yeah. Gosh, there. I feel like there are so there are so many moments, but I feel like um, actually the one that I talked about before is one that I, um, I I'll, I'll mention here. Just that I think there, when I've heard of people who have said uh, my career was changed in some way because of something that happened at Games for Change, um, and and it, and I think almost to contrast what Susanna is saying. And, and it was a moment that I didn't even know was that important. Uh, it's, I think there's a, the kind of converse of that is there's a multitude of little moments that also affected, uh, affected people. And I think that we have to give credit to that. As it's not really any of us that did that, but it's like everybody coming together in one place. It's what a community of practice kind of does uh, is, is enable that. And then also the field building that holds up a mirror back to people and say, oh, you can see yourself in the mirror and be like, oh, that's us. That's what we're. So I feel like there have been a, a number of moments, and I, I want to almost acknowledge the smallness of them um, that I think has been part of what's been, I, I think, it's pretty exciting. And for me, what's, what's always moved me the most and most consistently has been the opportunities to bring young people here who have been doing game design, who come into this space as young people, different from the space in so many different ways. The, the first time uh, I brought some young people here and we, we came back to their school in Canarsie and they sa I said, what was it like? And they said, they looked like us. And I was like, yes, you can be that. You can be one of those people someday. And then coming here with someone like Jesse Joe, who then gets to be on one of these stages, who had just graduated high school, who had had a very difficult life, and playing games, but also designing games is part of what saved her and gave her vision to move on and go and get a degree here at Parsons? Parsons? I think so. Um, uh, in game design, and has now graduated, is now out in the world as an educator, um, motivated to think about games and the impact they can have in the world. Um, that that always um, that always emphasizes for me the, the very personal deep impact that a space like this could have and what it means for young people to get access to environments like this. And so hearing, that's why I love hearing so much about what's happening now with schools in New York and, and around the country um, at all the different levels that, that young people are being touched because this is transformative. It gives them a vision for themselves in the Absolutely. future that they can see and move forward and not wait for. They can build it now as, as young people. Yep. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll talk quickly about the video. I don't know if you can show can, it. Can we show that video? I think they are going to show it. Okay. Yeah. Wait one second. So uh, just to give the context, how many of you showed the anti-Trump uh, 
a White House Trump uh, violent games uh, statement video that we did? Well, Trump did a video. Trump's right. The administration did a violent video. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the White House basically uh, made an 88 second video that was taken out of context all the most violent moments of, vid of uh, video games and we made in two days basically a rebuttal. We kind of produced this 88 second video uh, with volunteers and it became viral and maybe after the video I'll say why it's I think it's unique for the future of the uh, game. Can, can we have it with sound? <laughs> Susanna, you can speak about it as well. Uh, we did it together. No, no, not this one. <laughs> um, the, what do you have against me? You lack killer instinct. You're wet. We don't need this Intellectually one. insecure. You have addiction <laughs> issues. That, that's enough. I don't think all that. I'm no, just enough. trying to be dad's voice. Excellent impression. It's still well, playing down here on the... On the uh... okay. okay. So um, I think what, what was unique about this is that we, we were always uh, this community, I feel, in, in a bit of a bubble in the sense that you know, yeah, we had press stories, but I don't think we really and deeply connected with the gaming industry. Even the Games for Impact Award that you talked about in the Game Awards, in the Oscars of Games, you know, it's a small award. Usually they do it in passing. It's not even, you know, with a video or a big announcement. We're still, you know, very much a niche. And that was the first time that I felt, you know, because of the uh, feedback, a lot of gamers watched it. It was very viral. I mean, in three days, it got uh, half a million views. But it wasn't people from this community, I mean, also from this community, but mostly just gamers all around the world that, that started to say it made them feel proud. It made them feel that, you know, why do they love the gaming industry? Why do they love the games they play? And I feel that it's, it's really small. It's just the first step. But... I wish that we could be much more, you know, this community, much more connected to the gaming industry in that sense and speak to gamers directly, speak to parents directly. You know, Student Challenge is a great example, but get a bit out of the community and, you know. Well, I think it's, um, I do think there's time, there, this is the right time to have those conversations. Um, and we, I could probably kick off another hour discussion about um, the role that games could play in that, but we're gonna have to wrap it up. Uh, but I, I do feel like there is time for us to begin to have more of a public facing position to help change the conversation around games. And we know that it's happened with reading. We know that parents, we, that so many parents know they should read with their kids. And I, and I think it's starting to happen with games where parents say, oh, a good parent should perhaps play with their kid, not just outside, but play with their kids. And discuss in. the games. And then when it comes Talk to content, it. it's, it's not just about whatever the largest, most profitable studio games, it's, that's part of it, 
but it's also about like, well, what, what content do we want to be talking about in our families? I, I think this is a great direction for, and really congrats on that video. I think it's well, Thank you. And thank you to Asi. He, he led it creatively. Um, okay, I think that's it. We're going to wrap it up. I want to thank you, Barry, Ben, Suzanne, so and Asi. Too. It's been an honor to be up here with you guys. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Do we have a video from the show? Okay.